were wondering where you were. <laughs> All the smiling faces. Carol, boy, that's a good smile. I like that. Beautiful faces. Good to see everybody. Isn't it good to be here? And we're going to study God's Word and make an application to our lives each day. Before we begin our study, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day that you've given us. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the beauty of the day. Dear Lord, we're thankful for our lives that you give us. And Heavenly Father, help us as we live each and every day that we will live according to your will. And that we'll study your word each day and apply it to our lives. Lord, help us to be faithful to you in all things. And Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are sick, those that have in our congregation. We ask that you be with them, help them to have their good health again. Lord, we remember those that have lost loved ones. We ask you give them comfort and help us as Christians that we will comfort them. And Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your Son came to this earth and shed his blood on the cross for us. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was in such a hurry this morning, I made a serious error in judgment. <laughs> it is own. <laughs> Please turn that off. You get in a hurry and you forget those things. This morning, we're going to talk about a, a nation is divided. The nation of Israel is going to be a divided kingdom. And we're going to discuss chapters 6 through 14 of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapters 6 through 14 this morning. We're going to talk about how Solomon built the temple. We didn't get to cover that last week. Solomon builds his temple. Then the ark is brought into the temple. And then we'll talk about God's second appearance to Solomon. Then we're going to talk about the Queen of Sheba as a demonstration of his knowledge that God gave to Solomon. And we'll look also, I didn't get to cover last week, uh, another wisdom decision that Solomon makes, and we'll look at it briefly. And then we're going, to have, we're going to see how Solomon turns his heart from God. And then we'll look at Solomon's death and how the kingdom is divided. So we'll begin first with 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. Verse number 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt. The building of the temple begins here. It's the fourth year of Solomon's reign, if you read on in that verse. It's the fourth year of his reign. It marks a, a definite development in the Hebrew nation. Because now, they, all times before, they've been a nomadic people living in tents and, uh, since they left Egypt, living in tents and, and tabernacles. And now they're no longer going to have to do that. Now they will have a permanent building for the ark. Now let's look at verse 11. Verse 11 of 1 Kings 6. Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning the temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments, and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Now God is encouraging Solomon. He's reassuring him that He's, uh, that, that he is with him. But he also comes back with something else. He warns him. 
He warns him against failure to serve who? God. The one true and living God. It, your failure, if you have failure, it'll be because you stopped serving the one true and living God. So in verses 15 through 37, I'm not going to read those because we've got too many chapters, but in verses 15 through 37, it describes the beautiful temple. How much work they went in to building that temple. And uh, they, they talk about overlays of gold. How in that temple it's overlaid with gold. It's carved wood, artistic wood, both inside and outside that temple. Beautiful in every imagination we have. So in verse 38, and in the 11th year. So he started to build the temple in the fourth year of his reign. And now in the 11th year of his reign, the temple is complete. It took him about seven and a half years to build the temple. Uh, It had been planned a whole lot longer, hadn't it? David planned it. It had been planned a lot longer. It took careful planning. It took money. It took uh, uh, time. And then it also took prayer and hard work. And they did it. In chapter 7, 1 Kings chapter 7, he brings the ark in to the temple. Or, or not, not, not yet. Chapter 8 is going to do that. I, I meant to do this. Chapter 7 is when they hire Hiram from Tyra in verse 12. Chapter 7 and verse 12. He was a skilled craftsman. He was a, an expert working with bronze. And so he makes the furnishings for the temple. Now we're ready for chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, the ark is brought into the temple. Let's look at verse number 6 of chapter 8. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles, The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside, and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel and when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that, they, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And that's amazing right there because I don't want to get ahead, but the sacred ark's home at last, isn't it? It's, it's in its place. It signified that, that God is making His abode in this new home. A cloud filled the house of the Lord. A cloud is, is what? What is that cloud? The very presence of who? God. The cloud is the very presence of God. I tell you what comes to mind when you think of this, when you think of this cloud, or at least it does to me. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, what led them? A cloud. Yeah, a cloud. God, cloud. He was manifested in that cloud. Um, when um, I can also think in Exodus 33, 9, a cloud came down and filled the tent of the tabernacle, if you remember. And God spoke to Moses from that. Isaiah 6 and verse 4, the smoke filled uh, the temple when Isaiah had the vision. And the most important cloud of all, who can think of it? What is the wonder what would be the most important cloud of all? Mark chapter 9 and verse 7, I'll give you a hint. What was that? 
the Mount of Transfiguration, the Mount of Transfiguration. That remember the cloud that came down, and who was in the cloud? Anybody remember in the Mount of Transfiguration? Mo, I'm sorry. Yes, Moses and Elijah. See, we were studying, and we're going to be studying about Elijah, and he's going to make another appearance to this earth after he's gone. And he comes in that cloud, the very presence of God. Mark chapter 9 and verse 7. Verse 22, 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 22. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. Solomon is going to give his prayer of dedication to the temple. And here Solomon humbles himself to God. He recognizes the all-powerful God that nothing could have been accomplished without God. And so he's given him full credit He's humbling himself to God. Verse 27, Solomon says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Question mark. Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. God inhabits all of eternity. And sometimes we make God too small, don't we? He inhabits all of eternity. Uh, It's impossible for Him to dwell at one place at the exclusion of every place else. Boy, that's hard for us to understand, isn't it? He is eternal. He does that. God is ever-present. Even the heaven of heavens can't contain God. You know what I think of when I see that? I don't know about Hank and some of you others. Even the heaven of heavens can't contain God. I wished I would have been a science teacher. Because the first thing that comes to my mind, here's our Milky Way galaxy spinning in space, and we're on the outside, and we look like a little speck inside that Milky Way galaxy. And it's about 300 light years from Earth to the center I believe that's right. I'm just guessing. 300 light years. It could be less to the center of that galaxy. 300 light years. <laughs> that's, just, that's just amazing. And we're not the only galaxy. There's millions of galaxies. The universe is a very big place. But you know how we look at it? We look at it from humans, don't we, George? We look at 300 light years. If you were traveling 186,000 miles a second, that's how long it would, and you did that for one year, that's how long a, a light year is, speed of light. But that's humans. That's our time. That's how we figure. That's not how God figures. He, he owns the whole thing. And He has decided to dwell on earth Why? Why does he dwell on earth there? I wonder. Because that's a choice he made. He loves us. And he loved them. And and he decided he could be anywhere. And he was anywhere. He is anywhere. But his power is manifested in that temple there. God chooses to dwell with man. Because he chooses to do so. He's all powerful, all eternal, all seeing, all knowing. Yes, sir. Thank you, Hank. Yeah. Yes. He chooses to do that, doesn't he? The Holy Spirit dwells in us. He sealed us with that. And, and so we as Christians, he loves us. And he is with us. And he watches over us. And he answers our prayers. Isn't that amazing? That is a miracle. <laughs> I call a miracle. <clears throat> 
Let's look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass, when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, and the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time, as he appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house, which you have built, and to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprighteousness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever as I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Verse 6. But if you or your sons at all Turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and this house which I have concentrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Verse 8. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And they will answer, in verse 9, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them, therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. Verse 2. The Lord appeared to Solomon a second time. As he appeared to him at Gideon, He received his first vision at Gideon. And now here in Jerusalem, he's assured by God that he heard and answered his prayer. He and his descendants would be established on the throne of Israel forever. Verse 5. But he also reminds them that there must be a condition has to be met. A condition to continue to receive his promise There is a condition. What is that condition? Walk in my statute. Walk in my commandments. Obey me. Worship me and not idols. And don't turn away from me. There's a condition. Verse 6 and 7. But if you or your sons all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments. Do not keep my statutes, what I've set before you. But God, but go and serve other gods, he says, and worship them. Then will I cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and this house which I have concentrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword, he says, to all peoples. In verse 6 through 9, God is speaking about the apostasy from God, total desertion, total departure from God. The temple would become a heap of ruins, and the people who passed by would hiss and say, What happened here? What caused this? Why did this happen? Verse 9 says, Why has the Lord done this to this land and house? Verse 8, or that was verse 8. Verse 9 says, They will answer because they forsook the Lord their God. God brought them out of Egypt. um, They embraced other gods. They worship and, and serve them. And that's why the Lord brought this calamity on them. He knows what's going to happen, doesn't he? Well, sure. Now let's look at a couple of examples of his wise judgment. 
I missed this last week. Oh, did somebody have their hand up? Oh, I missed this last week. I should have covered it, but really it ties in with this week. So I'd like for you to uh, hold your place right there. Hold your place in 1 Kings chapter 10, and then I want you to uh, flip over to chapter 3, 1 Kings chapter 3. Just, we're just going to look at that briefly. I should have c- covered that last week. We're going to look at an example, uh, example of Solomon's wise judgment. In verses 16 through 28, two women came to the king. Now you have to watch me because I'm going to do this by my memory. So you watch those verses make sure I don't mess up. Two women came to the king. And what the problem was is there was these two women had newborn babies um, very close together. I think it might have been three days. Is that right? I believe it's three days. And so the, the one mother laid down with her baby and she laid on the baby during the night. And what happened to the baby? It died. The baby died. And so the other mother still has her living child, but that woman who the baby died, she gets up in the middle of the night and trades out the babies, gives that woman her, uh, her dead child and takes the living child and keeps her you got a problem because there's not any witnesses. There's no witnesses to this. And so they come before Solomon, and they're both wanting the living child, and they're both claiming that that living child is theirs. What in the world is Solomon going to do? You know what he does? God gave him what? Wisdom. God gave him wisdom to understand the, the, uh, the love of a mother. A mother will... I tell you, she's a wonderful creature. Because she will do what for her child? What will she do for her child? I'm sorry? Everything. She will give her life so that that child will live. She'll just do that. What a wonderful love a mother has for her children. And so we, we look there in, in, uh, in verse number 24. The king said, bring me a sword. <laughs> Wait a minute. He's going to take that living child and cut that child in half and give one half to one mother and give the other half to the other. But he really understands his... His wisdom that God gave him to understand a mother's love. And the mother says, Give my child to her. Only let the child live. Do not kill my child. What's the other mother say? What's she say? Kill her. Cut it in half. Give one half to one mother, one half to the other. I like that plan. And so Solomon immediately knows, there's the real mother. I'm going to give that baby to the real mother. Outstanding, isn't it? Look at verse 28. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Let me ask you a question. Why were they afraid of him? Why were they afraid of Solomon the king after they saw the wisdom that he had on display in this example? Why did they fear him? I'll tell you what I think. You wouldn't want to do anything wrong and have to go before Solomon, would you? Because he has a wise and discerning heart. He has the ability given to him by God to see the truth. You can't pull no wool over his eyes. You can't give him a good story. You can't can't try to influence him as a judge. It can't be done. And so they know if I do anything wrong and I appear before the king, he has a wise and understanding heart 
and He will administer true justice, won't He? That's why they're scared, I think. I would be if I did anything wrong and have to appear before Solomon. Okay, now let's go back. Flip back. Any questions so far? Let's flip back to 1 Kings chapter 10. Solomon is going to have a visit by the Queen of Sheba. We're going to look at some more examples of his, his kingdom and how his wisdom is. Verse number 1. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse number 1. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great uh, uh, retinue. I call that a train. (laughs) That's what I'm going to call it. A great train of camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions, and there was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had, uh, had seen all of the wisdom of Solomon, and the house that he had built, and the food on the table, and the seating of his servants and the service of his waiters, and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. He just took her breath away. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and I saw with my own eyes, and indeed half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame which I heard. Verse 8. Happy are your men, and happy are your servants who stand in continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices of great quality, quantity, I'm sorry, precious stones. There never again came such an abundance of spices as the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Verse 11. Also the ships of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, and great quantities of Almug wood and precious stones of Ophir. When the king made steps of the Almud wood for the house of the Lord and for the king's house and also harps and stringed instruments for singers. There never again came such Almud wood nor has the king uh, nor has the like been seen to this day. Verse 13. Now King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired whatever she asked besides what Solomon had given her according to the royal generosity so that she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Wow. Verse 1, the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, heard of his fame concerning the name of the Lord. And she came to test him with hard questions. Now this is really interesting to me. Queen of Sheba, she was prominent in Eastern legends. How do we know that she's real? Because the Bible says so. And you know how else? Because Jesus says so. If you look at Matthew 12 and verse 42, Matthew 12 and verse 42, Jesus calls her the queen of the south. In fact, he says, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Who is that? Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
So she came with great train of camels, verse 2, and she brought all this gold and spices and precious jewels. And, and, and she also came in verse 3 with hard questions. <clears throat> and he explained it all to her. Now, wouldn't it be interesting? <laughs> wouldn't it be interesting if there was a record of her questions? Wouldn't it be even more interesting if there was a record of the answers to those questions? That's just me and my little pea brain thinking about that. I, I, wouldn't it, though? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> We'd like to have a picture too. <clears throat> you can just picture it all in your mind. It must have been what a sight. What a sight. So she listened to him in verse 4. She listened to him. She saw the temple. She saw all the food served. I like this part. She saw the clothing that the people wore. What does a woman, a woman always notice? I know this. <laughs> what do they always notice? You put them in a room of 3,000 people and they'll notice something. You put them in a room of two people and they'll notice something. What is it they notice? What they're wearing. They just had this great sense and great observation. Like we walk into a room, men, we see one or two things. Three maybe. Not the woman. Boom, she knows the whole room. She has a special ability. And so here it's on display. She saw what, the, what they were wearing. She saw his manner of worshiping. That's the main thing. In verse 7, the queen says, I did not believe the words until I came and I saw it with my own eyes. And indeed, only half was told me from what I saw. What I see. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of all which I heard. Queen heard all those stories in her country, but they didn't even come close to explaining what she's able to see. <clears throat> Verse 9. The queen of the Lord, uh, the queen says, Blessed be the Lord your God. The queen is giving praise to who? To God. She's giving praise to God because of the wisdom and majesty that she knows God gave them and Him. So He gave her all that she desired, even above the royal generosity, and she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. 1 Kings chapter 11. Solomon's heart turns from God can you believe that? It can happen to him. It can happen to anybody. Solomon's heart turns from the Lord. Verses 1 of chapter 11. But the king loved many, daughter, many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonites, and the Hittites from the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. And he had, verse 3, 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. Verse 4, for, for it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart to other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was his heart, as was the heart of his father David. And then you can read down through there some of the, the idols and the false gods that he built for these wives that he had. In verse 9, so the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and, he, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, 
in verse 11, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. There's a lot of information right there. Verse 1, But King Solomon loved many foreign women. And the problem was, God said you can't be intermarried to those people. And the problem was, God said, these women will turn your heart to worship their gods. Solomon married these women and, and intermarriage was forbidden. And that's in Exodus 34 and verse 16 and Deuteronomy 7 and verse 3 and 4. These women had led Solomon to idolatry. Solomon had 700 wives and princes and 300 concubines. Verse 3. Most of these are probably daughters of generals and kings and noblemen. And the concubines were of lesser rank. They did not, their children did not get to inherit any property. We're all aware of the custom of the East, aren't we? They had multitudes of wives and concubines. But does that make it right? No, that doesn't make it right. There is no justification for Solomon to marry these women and build temples to their gods and even worship their gods. Joining in, in heathen worship. This shows us how far Solomon had fallen. Verse 6, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and was and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Here's a dis clear description, clear picture that God gives us of what happened. Verse 7 and 8, he built religious sites for false gods of the wives. He burned incense. He sacrificed to their gods. Verse 9, so the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. He had to know better down deep. Don't you think he had to know better? He was wise. He had all the wisdom that you could possibly have, but he didn't use what? He didn't use that wisdom, did he? He got away from him. But way down deep, don't you think he had to know better? Don't you think in today's world when, when we do things that are wrong and we try to cover up and all this, and, but way down deep, we know. Way down deep, more than likely, Solomon knew. Down deep inside, he knew what was going on. God had appeared to him twice. He had blessed him. He knew God. But he also knew something else. What God had told him, if you turn away. If you turn away aside to idolatry. Now listen. We have to be careful today, don't we? As Christians, do we have to be careful? You better believe it. We have to be careful. Regardless of events and circumstances that, that occur in our life, sometimes it's the big things that lead us away. But is that always the case? Sometimes it takes just the littlest thing. And over time, we fall away. We think everything's just fine. It's going to be just lovely. But little by little by little, fall away. Let me just, here's a simple example. There may be lots of Christians who forsake the assembling of the saints on Sunday morning 
to go out to the lake and fish and ski and do all those wonderful things every Sunday. And then it gets easier and easier and easier and easier to forsake. And you know what? Before long, they sold their soul for a jet ski. And without ever even realizing it, those are, is a message for us. We have to be careful today. Verse 11, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you, but God said it will not be till you die for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of your son's hand. Verse 12. And we're going to see that. Verse 13. However, I will not tear it away from oh, the whole kingdom. I'm going to give one tribe to your son. Son is Rehoboam. Now why did he do this? Why is he going to take ten tribes and give it to Jeroboam and he's going to give one tribe to Rehoboam, Solomon's son? Why is he doing that? If you think about it, you'll know the answer. It's a very important answer. The line of Jesus he is, he, is, uh, he is uh, keeping that safe. He's keeping that line safe. He's going to be the tribe of, uh, of Judah is what? It's where Jesus comes out of. So he's keeping that safe. And you know what? It was only by his... It was only by God's hand that that family, that that tribe is kept that way. Only by God's hand. He intervened and made sure that that stayed just like it was supposed to stay. <clears throat> the ten tribes would be given to Jeroboam. Jeroboam, uh, this was foretold by a prophet that he would have those ten tribes. And Solomon became suspicious of him. And so he had to flee to Egypt, and that's where he is. He's, he's hiding in Egypt. Verse 41. Chapter 11, verse 41. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, all that he did and all his wisdom... Are they not written in the book of Acts of Solomon? And the period of Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. <clears throat> Solomon did many great things, didn't he? For his people and for God. He developed a, a, a great and mighty kingdom. Splendor that you just couldn't hardly imagine. And he fell away due to sin in his life. I like to think of him myself. This is just me. I like to think of him as Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. After he's seen everything, he's done everything, he's sailed the seven seas, I, he didn't do that. He, he's done it all. He's built it all. He has it all. And so it says in Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. This is the gift of... This is the secret to life. 1 Kings 12. There's a, re, uh, there's a revolt against Rehoboam. In verse number 1, Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, is now king, but he's unprincipled. He is incapable of providing leadership for his people. And Shechem was the ancient capital of the north. It's 34 miles north of Jerusalem. It was the only place you could anoint a king. And Joseph was buried there in Joshua chapter 24, verse 32. And it will become the capital of the northern kingdom. 
Jeroboam had fled Solomon, verse 2, verse 3, he went to Egypt and, and he was called back. And so Jeroboam is a spokesman representing the ten tribes in verse 4, in front of Rehoboam. In verse 4, your father made our yoke heavy. The leaders of Israel demanding a change in policy because they refused to submit any longer to slave labor that Solomon had used them for in the building of the temple and all the other places he built. Rehoboam told them in verse 5, you go away and you come back in three days and I'll give you my decision. And so in verse 6, the king consulted with the elders that stood before him, that I mean, stood before his father Solomon. And he said, what would you have me to do? And so they, so they told him, be a servant to the people. Serve them. Speak good words to them and they will be your servants forever. But he refused their advice. And then he asked the young men he grew up with, what do you say I do in verse 8? Verse 11, they said, tell them that you're going to add to that yoke instead of using whips and we're going to use scourges. So Jeroboam, verse 12, all the people came back to him and he took the advice of the young men and the king answered the people in verse 13, I'm going to use scourges instead of whips. I'm going to add to your yoke. And he threatened all who would rebel against him. In verse 15, So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word. The Lord did this. God caused the people to rebel. It was part of his plan, because Rehoboam was not a good king. In verse 18, Rehoboam sent the tax collector, tried to collect taxes, and they stoned him to death. And so Rehoboam, I can picture this in the mind, he gets in his chariot and he makes haste back to Jerusalem. God told the man of God, Shimei, to tell Rehoboam and the tribes of Judah, see, Rehoboam's going to get him an army together, go back and unite the kingdom. But God said, no, you won't. That's not what I want. I did this. And so they turned around and, and came back. I'll say one thing before we finish. The kingdom lasted 120 years. The kingdom is divided. The northern kingdom lasts over 200 years. The first king was Jeroboam, and there are many kings after, and the Assyrians destroyed them. The southern kingdom made up of Benjamin and Judah. They called it Judah. The southern tribe lasted over 300 years. The first king was Rehoboam, and there are many kings after and it was destroyed by Babylon. You've been a very good class today.